Chapter 46 Daenerys The heart was steaming in the cool evening air when Cal Drogo set it before her, raw and bloody. His arms were red to the elbow. Behind him, his blood riders knelt on the sand beside the corpse of the wild stallion, stone knives in their hands. The stallion's blood looked black in the flickering orange glare of the torches that ringed the high chalk walls of the pit. Danny touched the soft swell of her belly. Sweat beaded her skin and trickled down her brow. She could feel the old women watching her, the ancient crones of Vias Dothrak, with eyes that shone dark as polished flint in their wrinkled faces. She must not flinch or look afraid. I am the blood of the dragon, she told herself as she took the stallion's heart in both hands, lifted it to her mouth, and plunged her teeth into the tough, stringy flesh. Warm blood filled her mouth and ran down her chin. The taste threatened to gag her, but she made herself chew and swallow. The heart of a stallion would make her son strong and swift and fearless, or so the Dothraki believed, but only if the mother could eat it all. If she choked on the blood or retched up the flesh, the omens were less favorable. The child might be stillborn or come forth weak, deformed, or female. Her handmaids had helped her ready herself for the ceremony. Despite the tender mother's stomach that had afflicted her these past two moons, Danny had dined on bowls of half-clotted blood to accustom herself to the taste, and Eerie made her chew strips of dried horse flesh until her jaws were aching. She had starved herself for a day and a night before the ceremony, in the hopes that hunger would help her keep down the raw meat. The wild stallion's heart was all muscle and Danny had to worry it with her teeth and chew each mouthful a long time. No steel was permitted within the sacred confines of Vaes Dothrak, beneath the shadow of the Mother of Mountains. She had to rip the heart apart with teeth and nails. Her stomach roiled and heaved, yet she kept on, her face smeared with the heart's blood that sometimes seemed to explode against her lips. Cal Drogo stood over her as she ate his face as hard as a bronze shield. His long black braid was shiny with oil. He wore gold rings in his mustache, gold bells in his braid, and a heavy belt of solid gold medallions around his waist. But his chest was bare. She looked at him whenever she felt her strength failing. Looked at him and chewed and swallowed, chewed and swallowed, chewed and swallowed. Toward the end, Danny thought she glimpsed a fierce pride in his dark, almond-shaped eyes but she could not be sure. The Kal's face did not often betray the thoughts within. And finally it was done. Her cheeks and fingers were sticky as she forced down the last of it. Only then did she turn her eyes back to the old women, the crones of the Dosh Kaleen. Kalaka Dothre Mrana, she proclaimed in her best Dothraki. A prince rides inside me. She had practiced the phrase for days with her handmaid Jiqui. The oldest of the crones, a bent and shriveled stick of a woman with a single black eye, raised her arms on high. Kalaka Dothre! she shrieked. The prince is riding. He is riding, the others answered. Rock! Rock! Rakaj! they proclaimed. A boy, a boy, a strong boy. Bells rang, a sudden clangor of bronze birds. A deep-throated war horn sounded its long, slow note. The old women began to chant. Underneath their painted leather vests, their withered dugs swayed back and forth, shiny with oil and sweat. The eunuchs who served them threw bundles of dried grasses into a great bronze brazier, and clouds of fragrant smoke rose up toward the moon and the stars. The Dothraki believed the stars were horses made of fire, a great herd that galloped across the sky by night. As the smoke ascended, the chanting died away and the ancient crone closed her single eye, the better to peer into the future. The silence that fell was palpable. Danny could hear the distant calls of night birds, the hiss and crackle of the torches, the gentle lapping of water from the lake. The Dothraki stared at her with the eyes of night, waiting. Cal Drogo laid his hand on Danny's arm. She could feel the tension in his fingers. Even a Kal as mighty as Drogo could know fear when the Dosh Kaleen peered into, into smoke of the future. 
At her back, her handmaids fluttered anxiously. Finally, the crone opened her eye and lifted her arms. I have seen his face and heard the thunder of his hooves, she proclaimed in a thin, wavery voice. The thunder of his hooves, the others chorused. As swift as the wind he rides, and behind him his calisar covers the earth. Men without number, with Iraq shining in their hands like blades of razor grass. Fierce as a storm this prince will be. His enemies will tremble before him, and their wives will weep tears of blood and rend their flesh in grief. The bells in his hair will sing his coming and the milkmen in the stone tents will fear his name. The old wo woman trembled and looked at Danny almost as if she were afraid. The prince is riding, and he shall be the stallion who mounts the world. The stallion who mounts the world, the onlookers cried in echo, until the night rang to the sound of their voices. The one-eyed crone peered at Danny. What shall he be called, the stallion who mounts the world? She stood to answer. He shall be called Rago, she said, using the words that Jeekwe had taught her. Her hands touched the swell beneath her breasts protectively as a roar went up from the Dothraki. Rago, they screamed. The name was still ringing in her ears as Cal Drogo led her from the pit. His blood riders fell in behind them. A procession followed them out onto the God's Way, the broad, grassy road that ran through the heart of Ves Dothrak, from the Horse Gate to the Mother of Mountains. The crones of the Dosh Kalin came first, with their eunuchs and slaves. Some supported themselves with tall, carved staves as they struggled along on ancient, shaking legs, while others walked as proud as any horse lord. Each of the old women had been a Khaleesi once. When their lord husbands died and a new Kal took his place at the front of his riders, with a new Khaleesi mounted beside him, they were sent here, to reign over the vast Dothraki nation. Even the mightiest of Kals bowed to the wisdom and authority of the Dosh Kalin. Still, it gave Danny the shivers to think that one day she might be sent to join them, whether she willed it or no. Behind the wise women came the others, Kalogo and his son, the Kalaka Fogo, Kal Jomo and his wives, the chief men of Drogo's Kalasar, Danny's handmaids, the Kal's servants and slaves, and more. Bells rang and drums beat a stately cadence as they marched along the gods' way. Stolen heroes and the gods of dead peoples brooded in the darkness beyond the road. Alongside the procession, slaves ran lightly through the grass with torches in their hands, and the flickering flames made the great monuments seem almost alive. What is meaning, name Rego? Caldrogo asked as they walked, using the common tongue of the Seven Kingdoms. She had been teaching him a few words when she could. Drogo was quick to learn when he put his mind to it, though his accent was so thick and barbarous that neither Sir Jora nor Viserys could understand a word he said. My brother Rhaegar was a fierce warrior, my sun and stars, she told him. He died before I was born. Sir Jorah says that he was the last of the dragons. Caldrogo looked down at her. His face was a copper mask, yet under the long black mustache, drooping beneath the weight of its gold rings, she thought she glimpsed the shadow of a smile. His good name, Daenerys' wife, moon of my life, he said. They rode to the lake the Dothraki called the Womb of the World surrounded by a fringe of reeds, its water still and calm. A thousand thousand years ago, Jeekwe told her, the first man had emerged from its depths, riding upon the back of the first horse. The procession waited on the grassy shore as Danny stripped and let her soiled clothing fall to the ground. Naked, she stepped gingerly into the water. Eerie said the lake had no bottom, but Danny felt soft mud squishing between her toes as she pushed through the tall reeds. The moon floated on the black waters, shattering and reforming as her ripples washed over it. 
Goose pimples rose on her pale skin as the coldness crept up her thighs. The stallion's blood had dried on her hands and around her mouth. Danny cupped her fingers and lifted the sacred waters over her head, cleansing herself and the child inside her while the Kal and the others looked on. She heard the old women of the Dosh Kalin muttering to each other as they watched, and wondered what they were saying. When she emerged from the lake, shivering and dripping, her handmaid Doria hurried to her with a robe of painted sand silk, but Cal Drogo waved her away. He was looking on her swollen breasts and the curve of her belly with approval, and Danny could see the shape of his manhood pressing through his horsehide trousers, below the heavy gold medallions of his belt. She went to him and helped him unlace. Then her huge cowl took her by the hips and lifted her into the air, as he might lift a child. The bells in his hair rang softly. Danny wrapped her arms around his shoulders and pressed her face against his neck as he thrust himself inside her. Three quick strokes and it was done. The stallion who mounts the world, Drogo whispered hoarsely. His hands still smelled of horse blood. He bit at her throat hard in the moment of his pleasure, and when he lifted her off, his seed filled her and trickled down the inside of her thighs. Only then was Doria permitted to drape her in the scented sand silk, and eerie to fit soft slippers to her feet. Cal Drogo laced himself up and spoke a command, and horses were brought to the lake shore. Koholo had the honor of helping the Khaleesi onto her silver. Drogo spurred his stallion and set off down the god's way beneath the moon and stars. On her silver, Danny easily kept the pace. The silk tenning that roofed Cal Drogo's hall had been rolled up tonight and the moon followed them inside. Flames leapt ten feet in the air from three huge stone-lined fire pits. The air was thick with the smells of roasting meat and curdled fermented mare's milk. The hall was crowded and noisy when they entered, the cushions packed with those whose rank and name were not sufficient to allow them at the ceremony. As Danny rode beneath the arched entry and up the center aisle, every eye was on her. The Dothraki screamed out comments on her belly and her breasts, hailing the life within her. She could not understand all they shouted, but one phrase became clear. The stallion that mounts the world, she heard, bellowed in a thousand voices. The sounds of drums and horns swirled up into the night. Half-clothed women spun and danced on the low tables, amid joints of meat and platters piled high with plums and dates and pomegranates. Many of the men were drunk on clotted mare's milk, yet Danny knew no rocks would clash tonight, not here in the sacred city where blades and bloodshed were forget forbidden. Cal Drogo dismounted and took his place on the high bench. Cal Jomo and Cal Ogo, who had been in Ves Dothrak when their with their Kalasars when they arrived, were given seats of high honor to Drogo's right and left. The blood riders of the three Kals sat below them, and further down Cal Jomo's four wives. Danny climbed off her silver and gave the reins to one of the slaves. As Doria and Eerie arranged her cushions, she searched for her brother. Even across the length of the crowded hall, Viserys should have been conspicuous with his pale skin, silvery hair, and beggar's rags, but she did not see him anywhere. Her glance roamed the crowded tables near the walls, where men whose braids were even shorter than their manhood sat on frayed rugs and flat cushions around the low tables, but all the faces she saw had black eyes and copper skin. She spied Sir Jorah near the, Jorah Mormont near the end, center of the hall, close to the middle fire pit. It was a place of respect, if not high honor. The Dothraki esteemed the knight's prowess with a sword. Danny sent Jiqui to bring him to her table. Mormont came at once and went to one knee before her. Khaleesi, he said, I am yours to command. She patted the stuffed horse-eyed cushion bef beside her. Sit and talk with me. You honor me. The knight seated himself cross-legged on the cushion. A slave knelt before him, offering a wooden platter full of ripe figs. Sir Jorah took one and bit it in half. "'Where's my brother?' Danny asked. "'He ought to have come by now, for the feast.' "'I saw his grace this morning,' he told her. "'He told me he was going to the western market in search of wine.' "'Wine?' Danny said doubtfully. Viserys could not abide the taste of the fermented mare's milk the Dothraki drank, she knew that, and he was oft at the ba bazaars these days, drinking with the traders who came in the great caravans from east and west. He seemed to find their company more congenial than hers. Wine, 
Sir Jorah confirmed. And he has some thought to recruit men for his army from the sellswords who guard the caravans. A serving girl laid a blood pie in front of him, and he attacked it with both hands. Is that wise? she asked. He has no gold to pay soldiers. What if he's betrayed? Caravan guards were seldom troubled much by thoughts of honor, and the usurper in King's Landing would pay well for her brother's head. You ought to have gone with him, to keep him safe. You are his sworn sword. We are in Vestothrak, he reminded her. No one may carry a blade here or shed a man's blood. Yet men die, she said. Jogo told me. Some of the traders have eunuchs with them. Huge men who strangle thieves with wisps of silk. That way no blood is shed and the gods are not angered. Then let us hope your brother will be wise enough not to steal anything. Sir Jorah wiped the grease off his mouth with the back of his hand and leaned close over the table. He had planned to take your dragon's eggs, until I warned him that I'd cut off his hands if he so much as touched them. For a moment, Danny was so shocked she had no words. My eggs? But they're mine. Magister Illyrio gave them to me. A bride gift. Why would Viserys want... They're only stones. The same could be said of rubies, rubies and diamonds and fire opals, princess. And dragon's eggs are rarer by far. Those traders he's been drinking with would sell their own manhoods for even one of those stones. And with all three, Viserys could buy as many cell swords as he might need. Danny had not known, had not even suspected. Then he should have them. He does not need to steal them. He had only to ask. He is my brother and my true king. He is your brother, Sir Jorah acknowledged. You do not understand, sir, she said. My mother died giving me birth, and my father and my brother Rhaegar even before that. I would never have known so much as their names if Viserys had not been there to tell me. He was the only one left. The only one. He is all I have. Once, said Sir Jorah, no longer, Khaleesi. You belong to the Dothraki now. In your womb rides the stallion who mounts the world. He held out his cup, and a slave filled it with fermented mare's milk, sour smelling and thick with clots. Danny waved her away. Even the smell of it made her feel ill, and she would take no chances of bringing up the horse heart she had forced herself to eat. What does it mean? she asked. What is this stallion? Everyone was shouting at it, at me. But I don't understand. The stallion is the Kal of Kals, promised in ancient prophecy, child. He will unite the Dothraki into a single Kalasar and ride to the ends of the earth. Or so it was promised. All the people of the world will be his herd. Oh, Danny said in a small voice. Her hand smoothed her robe down over the swell of her stomach. I named him Rago. A name to make the usurper's blood run cold. Suddenly, Doria was tugging at her elbow. My lady, the handmaid whispered urgently. Your brother. Danny looked down the length of the long, roofless hall, and there he was, striding toward her. From the lurch in his step, she could tell at once that Viserys had found his wine, and something that passed for courage. He was wearing his scarlet silks, soiled and travel-stained. His cloak and gloves were black velvet, faded from the sun. His boots were dry and cracked, his silver blonde hair matted and tangled. A long sword swung from his belt in a leather scabbard. The Dothraki eyed the sword as he passed. Danny heard curses and threats and angry muttering rising all around her, like a tide. The music died away in a nervous stammering of drums. A sense of dread closed around her heart. Go to him! She commanded Sir Jorah. Stop him! Bring him here! Tell him he can have the dragon's eggs if that's what he wants. The knight rose swiftly to his feet. Where is my sister? Viserys shouted, his voice thick with wine. I've come for her feast! How dare you presume to eat without me! No one eats before the king! Where is she? The whore can't hide from the dragon! 
He stopped beside the largest of the three fire pits, peering around at the faces of the Dothraki. There were five thousand men in the hall, but only a handful who knew the common tongue. Yet even if his words were incomprehensible, she had only to look at him to know that he was drunk. Sir Jorah went to him swiftly, whispering something in his ear, and took him by the arm. But Viserys wrenched free. Keep your hands off me! No one touches the dragon without leave! Danny glanced anxiously up at the high bench. Cal Drogo was saying something to the other cows beside him. Cal Jomo grinned, and Cal Ogo began to guffaw loudly. The sound of laughter made Viserys lift his eyes. Cal Drogo, he said thickly, his voice almost polite. I'm here for the feast. He staggered away from Sir Jorah, making to join the three calls on the high bench. Cal Drogo rose, spat out a dozen words in Dothraki, faster than Dan- Danny could understand, and pointed. Cal Drogo says your place is not on the high bench. Sir Jorah translated for her brother. Kel Drogo says your place is there. Viserys glanced where the cow call was pointing. At the back of the long hall, in a corner by the wall, deep in shadow so better men would not need to look on them, sat the lowest of the low. Raw, unblooded boys, old men with clouded eyes and stiff joints, the dim-witted and the maimed, far from the meat and farther from honor. That is no place for a king, her brother declared. His place, Cal Drogo answered, in the common tongue that Danny had taught him. For Sorefoot King, he clapped his hands together. A cart! Bring cart for Cal Ragat! Five thousand Dothraki began to laugh and shout. Sir Jorah was standing beside Viserys, screaming in his ear, but the roar in the hall was so thunderous that Danny could not hear what he was saying. Her brother shouted back, and the two men grappled, until Mormont knocked Viserys bodily to the floor. Her brother drew his sword. The bared steel shone a fearful red in the glare from the fire pits. "'Keep away from me!' Viserys hissed. Sir Jorah backed off a step, and her brother climbed unsteadily to his feet. He waved the sword over his head the borrowed blade that Magister Illyrio had given him to make him seem more kingly. Dothraki were shrieking at him from all sides, screaming vile curses. Danny gave a wordless cry of terror. She knew what a drawn sword meant here, even if her brother did not. Her voice made Viserys turn his head, and he saw her for the first time. "'There she is,' he said, smiling. He stalked towards her slashing at the air as if to cut a path through a wall of enemies, though no one tried to bar his way. The blade. You must not, she begged him. Please, Viserys, it is forbidden. Put down the sword and come share my cushions. There's drink, food. Is it the dragon's eggs you want? You can have them. Only throw away the sword. Do as she tells you, fool. Sir Jorah shouted, before you get us all killed. Viserys laughed. They can't kill us. They can't shed blood here in the sacred city. But I can. He laid the point of his sword between Daenerys' breasts and slid it downward over the curve of her belly. I want what I came for, he told her. I want the crown he promised me. He bought you. But he never paid for you. Tell him I want what I bargained for, or I'm taking you back. You and the eggs both. He can keep his bloody foal. I'll cut the bastard out and leave it for him. The sword point pushed through her silks and pricked at her navel. Viserys was weeping, she saw. Weeping and laughing, both at the same time. This man who had once been her brother. Distantly, as from far away... Danny heard her handmaid Jeequy sobbing in fear, pleading that she dared not translate, that the call would bind her and drag her behind his horse all the way up the Mother of Mountains. She put her arm around the girl. Don't be afraid, she said. I shall tell him. She did not know if she had enough words. 
Yet when she was done, Khal Drogo spoke a few brusque sentences in Dothraki, and she knew he understood. The son of her life stepped down from the high bench. What did he say? The man who had been her brother asked her, flinching. It had grown so silent in the hall that she could hear the bells in Khal Drogo's hair, chiming softly with each step he took. His blood riders followed him, like three copper shadows. Dan Daenerys had grown cold all over. He says you shall have a splendid golden crown that men shall tremble to behold. Viserys smiled and lowered his sword. That was the saddest thing, the thing that tore her afterward, the way he smiled. That was all I wanted, he said. What was promised? When the son of her life reached her, Danny slid an arm around his waist. The call said a word, and his blood riders leapt forward. Kotho seized the man who had been her brother by, his, by the arms. Hago shattered his wrist with a single sharp twist of his huge hands. Kaholo pulled the sword from his limp fingers. Even now, Viserys did not understand. No! he shouted. You cannot touch me! I am the dragon! The dragon! And I will be crowned! Khal Drogo unfastened his belt. The medallions were pure gold, massive and ornate, each one as large as a man's hand. He shouted a command. Cook slaves pulled a heavy iron stew pot from the fire pit, dumped the stew onto the ground, and returned the pot to the flames. Drogo tossed in the belt and watched without expression as the medallions turned red and began to lose their shape. She could see fires dancing in the onyx of his eyes. A slave handed him a pair of thick horsehair mittens, and he pulled them on, never so much as looking at the man. Viserys began to scream the high, wordless scream of a coward facing death. He kicked and twisted, whimpered like a dog and wept like a child, but the Dothraki held him tight between them. Sir Jor made his way to Danny's side. He put a hand on her shoulder. Turn away, my princess. I beg you. No. She folded her arms across the swell of her belly, protectively. At last, Viserys looked at her. Sister, please, Danny, tell them, make them, sweet sister. When the gold was half melted and starting to run, Drogo reached into the flames, snatched out the pot. Crown, he roared. Here, a crown for Cart King and upended the pot over the head of the man who had been her brother. The sound Viserys Targaryen made when that hideous iron helmet covered his face was like nothing human. His feet hammered a frantic beat against the dirt floor, slowed, stopped. Thick globs of molten gold dripped down onto his chest, setting the scarlet silk to smoldering, yet no drop of blood was spilled. He was no dragon, Danny thought curiously calm. Fire cannot kill a dragon. 